Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on chumbacasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's chumbacasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Hello, and welcome to The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello everyone. On today's podcast, we are looking back at the T20 Women's World Cup with former England international Catherine Leng and current German international Tina Goff. Welcome, Catherine and Tina. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the invite, Stephen. Hi, Tina. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too, Catherine. (laughs) Well, thanks for both joining us on the the paddock and the pavilion. And... um, We've also got some guest slots from the England A wicketkeeper, Ellie Threlkeld, and teenage vlogger Rosa Simpkin of Rosa Talks Ball. But to begin with, what are your overall thoughts of the tournament, Catherine? What a fabulous tournament. I mean, um, T20s are always very, very exciting. And, you know, not a close shot uh, sometimes. Because there can be lots of upsets caused, I loved it, but it's cricket, so I was going to love it. And I truly thought that England would be in with a very, very good chance. New regime, a new coach, very, very excited for it. Well, we'll come back to England um, uh, later in the show. And, and firstly, um, both pleased to have you both back on the on the paddock and the pavilion. And I, I promised Tina that um, Catherine won't take over the job as host this time when she was on last. <laughs> but Tina, Tina, what were your overall thoughts on the competition? Yeah, I mean, like Catherine, I loved it. I thought the standard of cricket was amazing. The fielding especially, I thought there was some absolute flashes of brilliance, which we've seen in past tournaments as well. But I think the fielding in particular has really gone up a notch in the last couple of years. Um, probably also down to the professionalisation, people being able to train every day. And that really showed, I think. I was a, I would have liked a couple more upsets, I think. There were some really good close games. Um, I think a couple of the West Indies games went right down to the wire. But a few more kind of giant slayings, I think I would have enjoyed. Um, we got a few close games as well, I think. Ireland, England at one point looked like it could have tipped in the other direction. But um, overall, it was a great tournament. Really happy to see big crowds that got bigger throughout the tournament as well. And I think South Africa getting to the final really helped that as well. And hopefully that will push on cricket, women's cricket in South Africa as well. Yeah, packed crowd at Newlands in the final. And also a great advert for women's sport again. Yeah, I mean... (laughs) There's no better advert than having packed out stadiums of men, women, children, all enjoying the sport for what it is. And it doesn't matter if it's women's cricket, men's cricket, it's entertainment. And um, I think that was a real highlight of the World Cup that even though there wasn't many upsets, upsets, every game was entertaining, real good skill on show all round, I think. Let's hear what Rosa and Ellie have got to say about the T20 World Cup. South Africa really turned it up in terms of the team and the fans. I mean, watching their games gave me genuine goosebumps because the crowd was so with them. They were cheering everything and there was such an atmosphere. And for them to be able to reach their first World Cup final in their home country, which they needed to boost the game, was everything. And although, of course, I'm disappointed that they beat England, I struggled to be too disappointed because of the reaction from everyone. I think that it was a great advert for women's cricket. We had some new teams in with Ireland and it was a great advert. We had some really close games. We had some not some close games. But yeah, I thought it was a great tournament and Australia were definitely deserved winners in the end. I thought it was a brilliant tournament. Um, I think obviously the women's game is just growing and growing, isn't it? And I think that just shows in tournaments like this. Managed to watch quite a lot of it. Uh, obviously, devastated that England didn't get over the line, but um, 
by the same token, I guess it's pretty good for, for women's cricket in general that other teams are, are competing and it's not just Australia running a, running away with it and, and, and England that it shows that like South Africa are, are capable and yeah, I think for women's cricket that was that was good to see. But obviously, yeah, from a bias point of view, very very good for the England girls. Yeah, twenty three matches, Catherine. But um, those Aussies who've now won six of the eight T Twenty World Cups won again. Yeah, I mean, with that, let's be honest, that was an upset we were wanting, wasn't it? You know, just to um, to for the Aussies just to to have a bit of a shocker, but. You know, one batter gets out, another legend comes in. It's they're they're a difficult they're a difficult team to be, and um, you know if one fails and another one thrives, it must be so tough for for all the other teams. But we saw some glimpses, didn't we, of of um, of them, you know, teetering a little bit. I thought. You know, Bangladesh played really well against them. They weren't the mighty titans that we thought they were. There were a couple of really good performances in there. But at the end of the day, they're they're good. Um, but we would have liked to have seen a, an Aussie upset. Yeah, the semi-final, they won by five runs and the final by 19 runs. Tina, are our countries getting closer to them, do you think? Yes, but the Australians always find a way to win. I think was it Gary Lineker's in the news a lot at the moment. I always think of his quote, uh, especially because of my German background about how football is a simple game, and after ninety minutes, Germany win. I think it's the same for cricket or women's cricket in Australia. Even if they don't have good games, as Catherine said, you get five wickets, and then suddenly Talia McGrath's coming in. And you think, when's this going to end? Um, so. Yes, Australia won, and that's what it says on the trophy, but I think countries are getting closer. Um, it's just that final, I think, competitive edge, winner's mentality, whatever you want to call it, that means Australia always get over the line. And I think that's the one thing the teams that are getting closer still have to to learn, and that's maybe where England fell down this tournament, which I'm sure we'll get on to chat about as well. Yeah, in the semi-final against India, shouldn't India have won that game? Yes, but that's what happens. I think is whatever position you put Australia in, they they seem to to find an answer. Um, and in that case, it was India chasing, and you think, okay, they're they're doing this, they're going to get over the line, and suddenly Australia find one more gear to shift up into, and they come out on top. Um, and I think that winning mentality, as easy as to get into a losing cycle, I think it's also easier to get into a winning cycle as well and then you end up on the right side of those results more often than not. So do you think the catches that because India didn't feel very well in that semi-final it's the pressure that Australia put on them? Yeah I mean for sure the the catches are what I mean it's a it's, a, it's an expression for a reason that catches Go win matches. Say it. <laughs> Sorry that's my one for the day <laughs> um, and just as we said that the fielding was so good throughout, that means that a game that's won or lost by five runs, that's going to be the difference as well. And that's how it ended up being in the semi-final. And Catherine, are the likes of Beth Mooney, Meg Lannin, Elise Perry, Elisa Healy, although they're now sort of in their early 30s, late 20s, are they, are they sort of raising the standards of all the other teams by being so good? Yeah, I, the li- but that list is endless, isn't it? That you know you can name another. You can probably name five that didn't even get picked in the squad that you know were sat sat at home in Australia watching it. It's um, I just think, yeah, they're just they're just so good. But I just India just don't seem to have that little that little five percent of. Like Tina said, maybe the winning mentality because it. I, I was truly sat on my sofa thinking India could do this when Rodriguez and Kerr were batting. I thought these two, um, you know, I've not really seen Rodriguez bat very much, but she really like said game on and and took it to the Australians. But they they just they just get the Australians get over the winning line but then I think Australia 
Um, I, I don't think England were were really pushed in the early stages, and and Australia might have been pushed um, just a little bit at times more than more than we were. Are other countries getting closer to Australia? What do Ellie and Rosa think? Rosa leaves us with her own prediction for the next world event due to be held in Bangladesh in September 2024. Yeah, I definitely do. I think they're definitely getting closer. I think it just shows the value of professionalism in, in sport. I think obviously they've been pro for a bit longer than the likes of England have. And I think that shows really. And I think now that England have um, professionalised the domestic stuff, I guess there's going to be more talent coming through and the standard of the game in this country is going to get better. And I'd like to think other countries will follow. And um, yeah, it might take a bit of time, but I think that countries are definitely getting closer. You think things like the 100 and even the, the WPL where England players are playing in is going to make a difference? Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of these franchise tournaments around the world are just great opportunities for players to go and play more cricket. And a lot of them play with the best in the world. And I think that's only going to drive the standard of the game. And should Australia have lost that semi-final against India? They only won by five runs. I guess they're a team who knows how to win, aren't they? And I think when you're a team like that, you find ways of winning games. Um, And yeah, that's almost the benefit of being where they are, I guess. But um, yeah, they're, they're a very good side, aren't they? A hundred percent. I think with the professionalism of the game going up and the increase of franchise tournaments, especially the women's IPL and hundred, you have players getting more opportunities than ever before and being in professional environments. And we saw in this World Cup that Australia, it wasn't easy. They had bad moments. They did struggle. Teams have got better at exposing their weak points. They lost to Ireland in a warm-up game, which was a shock. And then the India semi-final was extremely close and it shouldn't have been given how many they put on the board and yet India brought it right down to the wire and all of those Australian players looked like they thought they were going to lose that game teams are catching up and I honestly believe that there will be another winner at the next T20 World Cup we haven't got long to wait for that not at all (laughs) they keep they keep coming don't they (laughs) and in the final did South Africa was there not enough intent to start with? Because they only scored 22 in their power play. Yeah, they. I think, I think probably the nerves of the occasion. Um, I'd, I'd like to, you know, if it was me, I, I think if I was opening the batting in my own country, in front of that crowd, um, the crowd is wild. You know, they had choirs in there, they had bands, they had families. They, it must have been deafening. So for you to walk in to open in ba- the batting in your own country against the mighty Titans, you, you would have a bit of stage fright, I think, or I certainly would. And I think there must have been a time when Wolvard and was it Frit, uh, Fritz? Fitz, sorry. Um, must have just sort of like said, come on, let's pull our socks up. Let's put on a bit of a show. And and I thought Wolvart batted really, really well. Um, she really sort of like the adrenaline must have started pumping. And, and yeah, she played some fantastic shots. And she was the leading scorer in the whole tournament. Uh, and yeah. we've mentioned it. We'll move, move over to England um, because England had the... The batter with the highest average and uh, was Nat Siver Brunt. You, and you mentioned that were England not tested enough in their in their group matches? We did beat India narrowly, so that was a test for us. Yeah, I just feel, I just feel some of the uh, mo- more inexperienced players, and you can't blame them. They just, it just m- must have been something like a bit of a breeze early on, and and I think. For you to gain experience, you you need to feel that um, that heartache of being either losing or being close to losing, and you know this is something that those younger and experienced players will take away. Now they'll just say to themselves, "I don't want to feel like that." How we we lost in the semis, I don't want to lose in a semi final ever again. And 
it, it's just all about experiencing these things and you could see the real frustration couldn't you with Catherine Brunt in the end and Tina what do you think to England's campaign yeah I mean it looked solid until it didn't and um, as Catherine said I think it was a lot about not being tested early on and then when the pressure was on um, they didn't quite show up and um, I think maybe they're with the new coach and everything they're still not 100% sure of their best lineup they've got players going through transitional phases going out of the team coming into the team and that's a really exciting place to be in but it's probably not the place you want to be in in the middle of a World Cup campaign and the way that a few bowlers were chopped and changed suggested that the coach wasn't exactly sure of the direction he wanted to go so maybe this was just one World Cup too early for England but I think there's real hope for the future I mean someone like Izzy Wong who didn't even get in the team is currently tearing it up in the in India so um, the fact that players like that Lauren Bell is obviously still very young the fact that they're coming through and are only going to get stronger through these experiences and through these losses suggests that maybe next uh, World Cup England will be right where they need to be. And what do the two of you think to the England's approach of a la baseball, whatever you want to call it? Yeah, I, um, I'm unfortunately a bit old school, if I'm being honest. You, you can only do you can only do that for for so long. You can only do it when you're winning and then, you know, you lose and then you've got everyone criticising that approach and what have you. But I guess you've got to ride the waves, really. Um, it's a winning approach, but it can be, it can have a detrimental effect when it's when it's not going right. And whatever anyone says, cricket's a game of of luck it you know it's very difficult to play one way every game um and when you play against better teams as well you're hitting it in the air there's someone always going to pull you know a great athletic catch out of the out of the bag or you know you don't get away with error as much when you play someone like australia you know you've got going to get at least Perry on the boundary just making a fantastic stop and I'm I'm not a great great believer in in that approach I'm afraid um but I know a lot are so is it in the in the um the semi-final England made a fantastic start I think we scored about 50 in the first five overs so it was working then and then all of a sudden it seemed to unravel as we got nearer the last sort of five overs I just, I just think you've got to have your solid. You've got to have, you know, you've got to have some base. And I think the base for England in this tournament was Nat Siver. And I don't think she should have really played with the freedom if, if she was given that freedom. I think she needed to play a bit of a longer game and anchor, anchor an innings really to make sure that we did we did see it through or, you know, you pop Heather Knight in to, to steady the ship, really. Both of them are capable of doing that. But I don't, I don't really think, you know, every batter should just go in and try and wallop it. What's your thoughts, um, Tina? <laughs> I, I, I agree with that. I was just thinking to how different the South African was appro- approach was. And, Laura Wolvart, for example, was has been criticised and was allegedly not picked up for the WPL as well because of her slow scoring. But in the semi-final, she scored, I think, 53 off 44 after a relatively slow start. And in the final, again, you mentioned earlier, Stephen, I think they got 20 or 30 off the power play. Um, but she still finished on 61 off 48 and almost saw them home. So that's the kind of contrasting styles. You need someone still to be there. And if it means a slower start, but you've got a world-class player still there, that's a bit more stable and maybe not quite as um, thrill a minute, but that will probably get you more wins more often than not than the crash bang wallop of Basball, which is really great, as Catherine said, when it works. But when it doesn't, it seems to implode quite quickly. 
Um, of course, there's contrasting styles and it's great if it does work, but it's maybe something to think about for England for future, how they can maybe mould one or two players to really have this anchor role because they have so many amazing players at their disposal. That's not the problem. It's just where they fit in best into this puzzle of a batting lineup. But bowling wise, uh, Sophie Eccleston, leading wicket taker in the tournament. Yeah, I mean, I think that's unsurprising. <laughs> She's another one that seems to sometimes not even get out of second or third gear, but just gets wickets. I have faced her and I know why, because <laughs> it's pretty difficult. The height she has as well and the sp- different speed she bowls means it's it's very difficult to get the ball off the pitch, let alone score any runs. So, yeah, she's just a really consistent performer for England, still relatively young as well. So um, more amazing achievements to come for her, from her, I'm sure. And what about the other two England spinners, uh, Charlie Dean and uh, Sarah Glenn? Well, I think Charlie Dean was on the, the wrong end of a, a bit of a verbal assault from uh, Catherine Sivabrent, I think, which probably didn't do much for her confidence I get Catherine's frustration 100% as someone who can also be an angry fast bowler I get it um and these things always come out maybe not in the right way at not the right time I think it was a steep learning curve for both of them they both showed really good flashes of brilliance really great balls it's just about that consistency and about gaining the experience in the big games because that's not something that can ever be simulated in training or even domestic games It's about getting those balls in the big games. And I think they'll continue to grow. Both of them still very young, um, bright futures ahead of them. So what you're saying, it's all good experience for England with a young team or a mixture of a young young team, which uh, I'm sure Catherine will endorse that um, many of these players were introduced into the team by Lisa Kitely. Yeah, I mean, she's a great talent spotter, is Lisa. And yeah, um the younger players coming in have just oh they're absolutely using talent in in their own way they're all different characters and a bit just going back to the um Catherine Brunt incident um I think that's a good approach to have for some young players because some young players would be like I'm not going to miss field against her ever again and they'll up their game and but some younger players it would it would really rattle them and I think you can have that approach to some people but not others that's the beauty of being in a team that you know how each other ticks you know you know you can lift or up someone's game by having a bit of a go at them or have the softly softly approach and you know maybe that was um Heather's Heather's role a little bit should be mediating between that and and making sure things like that don't happen but I think just to go back to your original question I think yeah Lisa's brought in some absolutely cracking potential and they just just need um to feed off the knowledge of the Siver Brunts and um Heather Knight and with Amy Jones as well you know she's been playing a while and they just need to learn everything from them whilst they can, really, um, and get, you know, they're going to be getting lots of experience in different formats soon. So, you know, I think the future is quite uh, bright for the second cliche of the podcast. That's one each now. We we forget how young some of these players are. <laughs> Alice Capps is only, yeah. I think, uh, 18 and a half, I think. And, and we've also found out, Catherine, that Tina's an angry fast bowler as well. I know. Um, I'm I'm a bit yeah, scared maybe. now. I better be careful what I say. Might might be on yeah. the back. Thing. Don't miss field off my bowling, then we'll be fine. No, okay. I'll be in slip, so okay. No, she won't be doing <laughs> any running around. Um, let's Still behind uh, the keeper. <laughs> before we um, before we move on to talk about some of the other nations and and the, and the stars of the tournament, uh, this is what uh, Ellie and Rosa had to say about England. Um, I think they've had a pretty good tournament. I think um, they're playing a real fearless brand of cricket at the minute, um, which is really good to see. And I guess what people want to watch. And um, yeah, there's some youngsters coming through as well, which is brilliant. It seems like they're um, they're building something really special. And 
I guess even though they've not quite got over the line, they'll be pretty pleased with how they went. And there's some great individual performances there, and they'll have to bounce back quickly as well with the uh, with the Ashes coming up this summer. Do you like this new approach, and is that going to be part of like domestic uh, women's cricket as well? I do like it. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. I think it's it's entertaining. Um, and yeah, I guess that's what they'll want for it to filter down to to domestic cricket. So yeah, I guess yeah, I think I think it will happen. Yeah, whether it happens soon, I don't know, but um, yeah, I definitely think it'll be that's if that's what's wanted at the top level. That's what will what will be filtering down into the domestic stuff. I absolutely love the energy that John Lewis has brought with him, because obviously he's come from baseball. So he's come from an environment which plays extremely positive cricket. I mean, that Siva is just unbelievable. She She's proven her class again and again, but she continues to be England's standout player at tournaments. Despite the fact that she took a break a couple of months ago, she's come back as an even better player. Um, the free spinners were exceptional. Having them in our attack made all the difference. And it's good knowing they're all in their early 20s because we've got a lot of time with them left I think the group stage was really positive we played our best cricket we went out for positive intent even when things started to not go our way the aim was always to score and act positively um I think the semi-final South Africa were the better team on the day um but also I think we were a little bit complacent I mean Danny White did an interview after the last group stage game where she said that they would have to play Australia anyway, this tournament. So she was implying that a India would lose and B we would breeze past South Africa. Um, And it was our issue in the Commonwealth games as well. We thought we would win games, which we didn't. So that's something to guard against in the future, you think? Yeah, for sure. I think the complacency will lose games. Yes, we're atop the nation, but in T20 especially, anything can happen on the day. And if you're not going out there with the right intent and you're going out there thinking, yeah, I'm going to win this, you should do that. But you can't do it to the point where you're undermining your opposition. They're in the semi-final for a reason. And I mean, they fought to get there, South Africa, because they lost their first, they lost a load of games. And yet they still managed to qualify. Tina, who were your stars of the tournament? Well, to pick an obvious choice, I think Ash Gardner, especially after her performance in the final, has to be up there. She's somehow is a star for the team, but also kind of goes under the radar. Um, she's just quite unassuming, but is so consistent in the top order batting and then with the ball as well. Um, I think it's it's difficult in a team full of stars like Australia is to, to stand out, but... Um, I think she can always be relied on with a bat and ball and that's uh, why she was uh, able to perform in the, the final as well. Um, I think we've mentioned before Laura Wolvart. I think she really carried a lot of the responsibility in the South African top order, um, put in uh, pivotal knocks in the semi final. You could still argue in the final, even though they didn't get quite over the line, that she got them even within close uh, to Australia. So I think that those would be my top two picks. Yeah, Ash Gardner got 10 wickets and in the final, she played a crucial role being pushed up the order to number three, getting 29 in only 21 balls. Yeah, I mean, that's what you get with the, with the Australian team that you can just tinker around between pretty much three and eight and not be too worried. Um, but the fact that they they kind of give her the responsibility of going in at three in the final shows how much faith they have in her as well. And it was, she rewarded them in buckets. And Catherine, what about yourself? I'm going to say my players of the tournaments were anyone that scored runs and wickets against Australia. Nice. Um, So I think what I was really impressed with was Jyoti for Bangladesh, who I think ended up with like 57 off 50 balls. You know, to hold hold a team together against a giant, it uh, great. I think also we've got uh, New Zealand was so disappointing um, in the tournament alongside the West Indies, but 
I'd say Amelia Kerr really uh, stood out against Australia. She she got a few um, with the bat and she bowled really well, well and picked up a couple of wickets. So I'd say, um, yeah, anyone really that scored runs and got wickets against Australia. I'm looking forward to our chat about the Ashes coming up. One player I thought that um, made her an, impre- an impression was young uh, Orla Prendergast from Ireland. She got 60-odd um, against the West Indies and only lost very narrowly to the West Indies. Yeah, she would have been my kind of dark horse pick. I think she she was 12th player in the team of the tournament as well, so it was unlucky to miss out on that. But yeah, she's a great player with bat and ball. Also still very young, uh, will be benef- benefiting from the fact that Ireland have central contracts as well now and she should definitely be one that should get a look in in some of the franchise tournaments as well. Uh, she can bowl it quick, hit it far. That's all you need. And should there be more teams in the T20 Women's World Cup? Ten seems a bit bit foo, in my opinion. Well, speaking from the German perspective, I think we won about 30 teams and then we just about sneak in. <laughs> Uh, but that might take a while. So, yeah, I mean, I'm all in favour of um, increasing the teams. I think you always want different teams showing up at these tournaments because that's the way you get these upsets as well. I, as much as I love watching England against India or South Africa against Australia, we watch seem to watch those games every week. But it's games like Thailand against the West Indies that actually sometimes throw up the best results and also the best games. Uh, so I'm I'm all for that. And uh, yeah, I'll be writing a strongly worded letter to the ICC. And Catherine? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, and I'll probably go on to it a bit later, but that's what Fair Break is about, that these, uh, you know, there's a lot of rising stars in, in um, you know, countries that we don't necessarily think about, are like the big guns. And yeah, I think, I think probably let's be honest, it boils down to money and availability of sort of like the big venues, which hopefully, you know, that's something to think about for the future that they'll, you know, in 10 years time, there probably will be more teams, women's teams in the T20 World Cup because, you know, if this World Cup has proved anything, it's proved that, you know, one nation, South Africa, really jumped on board of women's cricket now. I mean, um, I'm actually quite pleased for South Africa that they beat England because I can see a greater good for it that now the South African women's team is, is you know, they're heroes of the country and that was really lovely to see. And, you know, that's going to have a knock-on effect of other, other countries. And let's predict in 10 years' time that Germany are going to be in the T20 World Cup and they might win it. On penalties. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll have, they'll have an angry fast bowler as well, Catherine. Don't think yeah, that. very angry. Very old angry fast bowler. <laughs> Before we move on to talk about the Ashes, let's hear what Rosa thought of how many teams should compete in the T20 Women's World Cup. Should there be more countries in the T20 World Cup? A hundred percent. I think it's so important, given the rate the game is growing, creating these opportunities for the smaller, not necessarily smaller, but smaller countries. I mean, we saw Ireland come out of this World Cup, the complete underdogs, and yet they still came out every game like they could win. And they fought for it and they had some really good performances. And there's nothing stopping there being a couple more teams in the same amount as the men's game. Now, on June the 22nd, 2023, the Ashes will begin at Trent Bridge for a five-day test match. I know I've spoken to Catherine before about this, that she Yay. was advocating for five <laughs> days. We we included that in one of our previous podcast chats. What do you think are England's chances in the Ashes? The last two, we've lost 12-4. Yeah, we're, we're on home to distinct advantage. Um, I think we're going to get some good home crowds rumor has it uh england have sold 55,000 tickets for the women's ashes so far 
I think I read that correctly. I think 14,000 of them are at Edgebaston and there's a big campaign to fill Edge, Edgebaston for, for the game there. I'm quietly optimistic. You know, like I said, we're on home home soil. We've got um, got a large squad to to pick from. The head head coach, John Lewis, has, has got, you know, one, one tournament under his, his belt. So... I'm sure they'll be working really, really hard to to make it something really special. And Tina, do you think with the Test match being the first first game, gives England a better chance? Because we ran them very close in the uh, Test match in in Australia at the Manuka at the Manuka Oval. I better get this right um, for our previous podcast, and I'm going to get her name in again here, Karen Motika, the uh, author of Fair Break, the book, it's not the Manuka Oval, it's the Manuka Oval. Yeah, there you are, Karen. Um, yeah, I think going into the test with a, a blank slate and none of the T20s and ODIs having already been played, I think will play into England's hands. Home advantage, as Catherine said, so get that ball swinging. Um, and then anything can happen. I mean, in an ideal world, what you want to happen is that the 2023 Ashes for women's cricket kind of does what the 2005 Ashes did for men's cricket and really just inspire the country. Whether we end, we whether England end up winning or losing is actually neither here nor there, but just inspiring youngsters to take up cricket, um, seeing players who are maybe becoming household names. I think that's what it's all about. And I'm I'm really pleased how it has been marketed. Uh, this year more than most that there's been a lot of combined marketing as well it's not just been the men's ashes but it's been the ashes as a event for both uh, men and women Uh, so I think that was a really smart move and I hope that pays off with big crowds and hopefully great cricket and you're right about the ticket sales uh, Catherine Um, 55,000 I read on the (laughs) yeah and I think it said in 2019 the total was only about early 30s, so we're well ahead of that with the first match not being until 22nd of June. Fabulous. What about the Ashes? Can, can England win the Ashes back? I think so, yeah. I think obviously they, they can, and I think they've, they've got to believe that in their dressing room as well. Um, just spoke about Australia being a really good side, but so are England, and yeah, I definitely think they've got the skill in that dress, dressing room to, to win it back, so... I'm really looking forward to that. I think it'll be a really good, uh, really good series. You mentioned earlier about the growth of the women's game and ticket sales for the Ashes, uh, over 55,000. And I was reading that the last time uh, Australia came to England, it was only 32,000. And we're sort of June the 22nd when it all starts. Yeah, it's been been brilliant, hasn't it? I think that just shows how much the game's growing. And I think they've done a really good job with this Ashes of promoting it alongside the men's as well. I think that's what, what it needs ultimately. And um yeah, it should be a really good series. I'm looking forward to it. I think our chances are the best they've been in a very long time. We've got some really good young talent coming in in Izzy Wong, Charlie Dean, Lauren Bell, Alice Capsey, Freya Kemp, if she's fit. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the crowds as well, because the crowds are so important, especially in the Nashes, and they will rile the players on. I think the mix of youth and experience is going to be really important. I think we need to make sure we're putting our best foot forward in terms of selection. There are players who continually get picked for England who aren't really playing, where we need to have our best players in that squad and we need to be playing our best 11 every game. And that might mean some difficult decisions, but I think we have a really good chance. I then asked Catherine about her own Ashes experiences. Catherine played four of her 12 test matches against the Aussies. And and you've played in Ashes Test matches. We won't go that far back, but 1998 <laughs> and 2002 stroke three. Um, how different is it playing in an Ashes Test to playing in a Test match against other nations? There's something special about playing against Australia. It's just, it's just an ancient old rivalry and both teams want to do one over on each other and and there's just an intensity that you don't really get when you know you're you're playing other countries it's kind of like in big bright lights flashing it's the ashes and it's 
you know, you're just desperate to um, to beat the Aussies, really. Um, and, you know, 20, 20 years on, I'm, I still want to beat them, sat on my sofa with a beer in my hand. I still, you know, will the other team on, I'm afraid. It's just, it's just an old rivalry, really. I've actually got a, a question for Catherine, if I could. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm surprised. I'm, surprised. I'm, surprised. I'm surprised that she hasn't t- tonight. Um, she, um, Catherine, hasn't taken over the taking over the podcast. Um, I'm so, trying uh, really hard. You're doing very well, <laughs> Tina. But by all means, have a ask her ask her Go a on. question. Be gentle. So, so I was just wondering about how the kind of rivalry of the Ashes has changed because nowadays a lot of the players from both England and Australia must be mates playing in the same franchise teams all over the world and of course as soon as you step onto the pitch it's big rivalry and down to business but how was it when you played because I assume you didn't know the Australian team as well as they might do now no it was it was just you know we'd be sat in an airport I remember um being in India in the World Cup and we had a a CD player this is how long ago it was and we had our cd playing and the aussies walked into the same airport and they had a bigger cd player than us and it then became a rivalry of who could turn the volume up the most it it that's exactly just says it all in a nutshell that it there was we didn't know them that well we didn't like them on and off the pitch for for quite a while because it was always billed as this great big rivalry but actually you know we had some absolutely cracking end of tour nights out which you know what goes on tour stays on tour third cliche of the podcast um and you know we began to get the the more we played them like you've just said the more we got to know them and um but yeah the the girls now, I mean, they all play in the same same team together and play quite a lot of a lot of cricket together. Yeah, it's massive, massive difference. Yeah, that's what that's what I feel. It's, it's really interesting just to see yeah. how much has changed in the last few years. And you, there's so many teams, so many franchises flowing about now that I mean, it's amazing. And as we already mentioned, something like Fairbreak, you play with ten different nationalities, but to go from maybe rooming with someone being best mates with someone and then yeah. the next day you're your uh, direct rivals it must be quite difficult to kind of get in your head uh but I suppose that's the nature of kind of competitive sport as well yeah I guess that's something you know that um I'd not even thought about once the teams have gone professional that you know that is a big difference between amateur and professional as well we wouldn't see the Australians maybe for we'd see them for a tour and then wouldn't see them for two or three years and that now just seems really crazy thank you very much to my two co-hosts there um uh, pleasure uh, tina's now (laughs) taken over your role there catherine Uh, (laughs) i just looked up while while you were talking there because i i I went i went downstairs and got a cup of tea but i've come back again but um your your last test against australia was 2003 in sydney and you opened the batting and Charlotte Edwards went three. So, you know, say no more, really. Yeah, I do. I remember um, batting with Lottie quite a lot in that test. can't remember who I opened the batting with, but we were there and we actually thought at one point we could actually um, rattle them a little bit. And I remember Belinda Clark throwing the ball to Lisa Stilaker and saying, oh, nickname was Shaker. Shaker, we really need you to get a wicket. And I was thinking, oh, come on, you know, we we could actually do this. But it was never to be. Yeah, you opened the batting with Sarah. Come on, you should know the answer. Oh, Sarah Collier. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, we batted quite a lot together, actually. We kind of like put in there to, to try and wear Catherine Fitzpatrick out so that we bore the bruises of of her and then... But I remember batting with Lottie um, quite a lot against the Aussies. Well, we better not talk too much about that because we're going to be no. um, going going to hopefully have a podcast with you 
later in the summer when I've got young teenage vlogger alongside me, Rose, <laughs> Rosa Simkin, to Brilliant. ask questions as well. So we'll get two people. We'll probably have three hosts for the same podcast then. Um, <laughs> uh, so looking forward to the summer or for Tina, Tina's shortly, you're shortly going to go out to Hong Kong to play again in the fair break competition. Yeah, that's right. So the, the start of April is the the second fair break invitational. I was lucky enough to be there last year. It was in Dubai. Um, and this year I've been invited back. I'll be representing the Falcons again. I think uh, from a completely unbiased point of view, we have the best team. <laughs> We've got Susie Bates, Chamari Atapatu, Danny Wyatt, Marizan Cap. I mean, uh, I feel like I want to pinch myself a bit just to be in that kind of company. And yeah, even beyond just the matches, just the the experience of being with those kind of top players and also other associate players. And that's kind of what it's all about, um, putting these players together in an environment where you can learn from one another. And obviously, I can't teach Susie Bates much about batting, but I can tell her what it's like playing in an associate country, the kind of hurdles we have to to jump over so it's a really really fantastic setup and I'm I'm so excited to get back out there and you've got crowds this year as well yeah fingers crossed so last year I was in Dubai and it was amazing being in the, the international stadium there but it felt quite hollow because it's a huge stadium and we weren't able to have many crowds this year it's in a much smaller uh, cricket club so hopefully we can get quite a nice atmosphere going they're already selling tickets I think so shameless plug there um and yeah it should should be really nice and i've never been to hong kong before so i'm really looking forward to, to the whole experience oh you can always plug uh, uh fair break on this podcast it starts on the 3rd of april and finishes on the 16th of april and yeah tickets are on sale Lovely. and um what are, what what other matches of germany got lined up for the summer so we've got uh world cup qualifiers coming up um, this year, the European qualifiers have actually been split into two divisions for the first time ever. So at the end of May, we're heading off to Jersey uh, for the Division 2 qualifier, which is uh, six European teams. If you're going to ask me to list them, I really don't want to miss someone out. <laughs> but it's uh, Jersey, uh, France, Germany, Turkey, um, Italy and... I'm really sorry to the one. I, no, that is six. Is that six? I hope that's six. Included um, you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> that would be a round robin format. The top two uh, of that, those countries, which we're, of course, hoping to be part of, will then go to Division One, which is, I think, scheduled to be in Spain at the start of September. And that will be against Scotland and the Netherlands, plus the two qualifiers from Division Two. Uh, so potentially a lot of cricket to look forward to this summer. Uh, hopefully a really positive uh, summer of cricket for Germany. So you'll be playing against Poppy from France then? In the... Yeah, I will. So the, the trash talk has already begun. And this is kind of what we were saying as well about friendships across countries that we uh, just by touring and stuff, have got to know each other quite well and the teams get along really well. And we really, really want to be each other. But after every game, we always, I think even maybe even more so with the associate countries because there is this sense of camaraderie and trying to build up cricket in a country which is not that receptive to it and we're all kind of fighting the same fight uh so once the final ball has been bowled we're all uh yeah really good friends and what are your thoughts on on fair break catherine oh i think i think it's amazing imagine you know being able to play in the same team as uh Susie Bates and Cap and um, just it it must bring um, you know your game on leaps and bounds just being a just playing alongside them and playing against big players and you know it's a bit like uh, the IPL at the minute where they've got you know a lot of Indian girls playing in the team it's just going to raise the standard of women's cricket uh tenfold and it and it can only be a positive thing and it's you know it's just getting as many women and girls playing the game um and I think you know it sounds like it's got fantastic backing I think it'll be amazing to play in front of crowds uh Tina I think you know just um it must have been 
yeah, that must have been just the one factor in playing in Dubai, which must have been a little bit disappointing, but um can imagine you'll get some good good crowds in. And what a great place to play a tournament as well. Good yeah. luck. Thank you. Really looking forward to it. So I'll, I'll, I'll follow that. it. <laughs> and and Catherine, are you going to be playing this summer? I'm I'm gonna give it give it a go they can wheel wheel me out when they're desperate um but Sussex have have just announced there's going to be a Sussex Premier League in which um Brian and Hove the team I'm playing for will be part of so I'm hoping they they might wheel want to wheel me out for a, a couple of games but you'll be feeling in the slips though you say yeah I'll try, I always try but it's a bit mid on mid off now which i've never mm. i've never really fielded there it's a whole it's a whole new world seeing a game from that angle you know so you won't be diving around like um elise perry on the boundary i do you know what i sometimes forget i i do sometimes forget that you know i'm nearing the old half century now and uh and i could very much give myself whiplash doing that you just can't help it it's instinct you see ball and you want to stop it <laughs> absolutely well before we uh total up the cliches i don't know who's winning in the competition but <laughs> think, um you know. final thoughts on the 2023 t20 women's world cup yeah i mean it was a fantastic start for 2023 which is promising to be a really really exciting a uh, year for women's well, women's sport in general and women's cricket as well. Um, please, South Africa got to their home final. I think Catherine mentioned it. Kind of, it was disappointing for England not to get to the final, but actually, I felt kind of happy for for South Africa because England will get there and they will learn from the defeat. But to for South Africa to get there was amazing, and it kind of didn't almost didn't matter that they didn't win in the end and. Yeah, an amazing tournament, and I'm sure many more to come in the coming years. I mean, I t- I totally agree with that. I couldn't have put it any better. Um, I just really enjoyed uh, watching the games that I managed to watch, and uh, I can't cancel my Sky Sports subscription because there's just so much cricket coming. Um, I'll just feel like I'm missing out. So, thanks to both of you for being on the paddock and the pavilion. Hopefully we can catch up again and, and review the Ashes. That will be sometime in July, I think, when we can review the series and see how England get on. Best of luck in fair break, Tina. And Thank also, you. Catherine, we're going to have your double header when myself and Rosa will be talking to you about your own Ashes experiences. Yeah, um, get your cup of hot cocoa ready and, yeah. Catherine, by the fireside. <laughs> Well, thanks again for both of you joining me on the Paddock and the Pavilion. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Paddock and the Pavilion. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Pad and Pav. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network. With Lucky Land slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.